So when, I, when, I, when we like set out to do bots as a, as a company, like I said two days ago, one of the things that I did was I went back and I tried to find like what had been done before. Like what, who could I learn from? Were there examples or, that, that could give me like a longer term perspective? And one of the first things that I found was, you know, that, I, that was, I was reminded of this, of this bot that lived on AOL Instant Messenger way back when I was in college called Smarter Child. Um, so I was like, huh, I wonder, you know, I kind of like vaguely remembered um, talking to Smarter Child when I was in college, but I, you know, so I Googled it and the, one of the first things that I found was the, a video that they made to like announce their, their launch or like to promote their company. And this video is, I just love this video. I fell in love with this video for so many reasons. But I think, and we're gonna show it here in a second and you guys are gonna thoroughly enjoy it because I do. Um, but this is a historical document of the, the, of the times. And I want you guys to think, watch this video and think about what you see and try to keep, you know, put it in context of the fact that this is, we are now here 16 years later doing some of the same things that these guys did way, way, way back then. And how, how, how some things are the same and how some things are so, so radically different. And I want you to think about how when you sit down and, and, and work on your, on your thing and think, like, am I doing something new and awesome or, like, the same thing that somebody's done a million times? Like, it basically doesn't matter, and both of those things are probably true. Um, so uh, without further ado, we're going to play the um, circa 2001 or 2002 um, launch video for the Smarter Child Company um, Enjoy this. And the reason is that this is a big fucking idea. And what's interesting about this big fucking idea is it's like a lot of big fucking ideas. It's simple. It's a simple idea that everybody should have thought of, but we thought about it first. When I heard this pitch, it blew my mind. It was the biggest duh, I think, that, uh, <laughs> that I had had in my entire life. And why hasn't somebody thought of this? I can't remember exactly how the idea came up, but all of a sudden it was just there. Well, it occurred to us that the instant messenger programs, people already have them, they know how to use them, they're comfortable with them. What made me think it was a big deal was when we showed it to the venture capital guys, and a couple of days later, we went back to their offices, and they were all using it. From the idea to the first round of funding, we're looking at some five weeks time frame. This is certainly one of the fastest companies to launch, and uh, hopefully one of the fastest companies to be ultra successful. What Active Buddy is doing is completely revolutionizing the way instant messaging is used. Today, if I want to talk to Susie, Susie's online, and we can have a real-time conversation. What Active Buddy has done is replaced Suzy with a computer robot that has information services embedded. I can ask that robot to answer certain questions. At launch, we'll have a range of services that you can access on Active Buddy. As we move forward, we'll be adding some, but what we started with were the things that people seem to be using on the internet all the time and can do it virtually instantaneously. The cool thing about Active Buddy is it puts all of those things in one place right at your fingertips whenever you need it. The only asset you have, the only tradable currency is how quickly can you move, uh, and that, that's the only thing that you need. One of the great benefits of our service is that there's nothing to download. What somebody does is they go to their buddy list, and you add Active Buddy to your buddy list just as you would the name of a friend. Once Active Buddy is on your buddy list, you are now connected 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So if you want to know the weather in New York, boom. If you want to know if there's any news about America Online, type in news, AOL, boom, you get 10 headlines. That's just amazing. Okay, what information do you need? Okay, I can get you a quote just, just one second. Almost any type of data, any type of news, any type of information can be pumped into that window. And they're up 0.6875. We also tie the data into uh, some things that are useful for kids such as dictionaries and thesaurus, so define the word dog, and pop goes uh, definition and so forth. When you do a web search and you say, search Apple, 
it will come up with the top 10 links for Apple. You can click in the Instant Messenger window and it opens up a web browser for more information. So the Instant Messaging application works seamlessly with the web. Buddy has something like 21 content providers today and the list keeps growing. The major content providers are companies like Reuters, the leading information provider worldwide, and CBS Sportsline, one of the largest internet websites covering the sports industry. Almost any type of data, any type of news, any type of information, also gaming, can be pumped into that window. The internet doesn't stand still. Ten years ago, there was no World Wide Web. Three years ago, hardly anybody used instant messaging. Today, instant messaging is one of the most used applications on the web. Wherever instant messaging goes, Active Buddy goes. From RIM to Palm Pilots to cell phones, we'll be there. Just imagine what's going to happen to instant messaging when Active Buddy pumps information into that window. We think it's going to explode. All right. Please welcome to this talk about stage. One of the co-founders of ActiBuddy, Robert Hoffer. Thanks, Ben. So, and thank all of you guys for, uh, for coming. So everybody's been talking about what they're doing with bots, and I've talked a couple of times about what we did with Smarter Child back in the day. And so today I'd like to take a slightly different tack and talk about why we're doing bots. Why do we keep coming back here? Um, and, you know, it really wasn't new even when we started doing this in 1987. That'll be the theme of what I discuss a little bit today. Um, back in 1987, 30 years ago, uh, Apple produced a fluff piece called the Knowledge Navigator. And you can see this little guy is an avatar and it's a talking bot. And so the idea of having talking robots or um, artificially intelligent agents has existed in the minds of computer scientists for you know, three or more decades. And in fact, the whole concept goes back significantly further than that. Now, fast forward 13 years and we started Active Buddy, which lived as a company between 2000 and 2006. Our main product was Smarter Child. Smarter Child was the first commercial chatbot, and with Smarter Child, you know, he was witty and he knew stuff, and um, he had 30 million users, which we gathered in under six months, and he represented 5% of all instant messaging traffic, billions of messages, uh, hundreds of millions of messages daily, um, and he was the most popular bot in the history of bots, and when I say popular, I mean popular in that people liked him unlike Siri, whom everybody universally doesn't like, but Apple force populates onto all your phones, people enjoyed talking to Smarter Child. Smarter Child lived on the three main instant messenger platforms of the day, uh, which back then had a few hundred million users. Uh, they were, of course, AOL uh, and ICQ, Yahoo and Microsoft Messenger. All three of those platforms, of course, are dead today. Um, I don't know if Smarter Child was the first meme uh, on the internet, but he was certainly one of the early memes. People would copy their conversations with Smarter Child down, and uh, this is Smarter Child versus Superman, which I liked very much. Um, people always tried to have sex with Smarter Child. They universally failed to have sex with Smarter Child. We had a guy named Chris Bray, whom you saw in the video. Uh, Chris has recently left his job uh, heading up Apple.com, and his whole job at Smarter Child was to develop our product, and one of the things he built was our curse word filter, which was um, an extensive, perhaps the most extensive curse word filter in the history of curse word filters. Microsoft, in their infinite wisdom, bought Smarter Child and Active Buddy uh, as Coloquist Corporation uh, for $46 million, and they immediately lobotomized the bot. Uh, they tried to develop a business out of customer service applications, uh, grew the division to 160 million people across uh, two different divisions, a platform division and a development division, sold, oh, I don't know, 300 bots, uh, and then they retired him in 2009. 
rest in peace, smarter child. So, fast forward to 16 years later and to my great amazement, bots are back. Uh, why? Why do we keep coming back to this? Perhaps it's because um, instant messaging as a platform is way bigger. You know, there needs to be a slide, a compulsory slide of logos. But these logos are all instant messaging platforms. There's significant number of instant messaging platforms. And to some extent, those platforms are beginning either on a top-down basis or on a bottom-up basis to build the notion of artificial intelligence and the notion of bots directly into their platforms and provide platform support to the development community. And of course, now, uh, instant messaging is, that we know, a lot more than just text. It's text and group chat and audio and video and virtually everything you do, you can do within the confines of the instant messenger window. But why the long gap? So I had a professor at Columbia, his name was Richard Bullitt, and he wrote a book about the camel and the wheel in which he discovered that for a thousand years in the desert, people forgot about one of the most important human inventions, the wheel. Why? Well, you know, in the desert, the wheel isn't very useful. A camel is a lot more useful. You don't even have trees, which is kind of the source of wheels. So we tend to forget technologies. And in fact, the patenting system is not designed to protect us, you know, the developers. It's designed to protect the intellectual property from being lost to time. So I think what's happened is that we're fascinated with the whole notion of artificial intelligence as a concept. And so Hollywood has uh, brought us artificial intelligence in every form they can imagine. Um, there have been good bots like Gigantor and the space robot in Lost in Space, and they've had bad bots like Skynet and HAL, the sociopathic robot in 2001. And there's bots that become human like Robin Williams' character in Bicentennial Man, or humans that become bots like Johnny Depp's character in Transcendence, and then there are bots as humans, as early as Blade Runner, uh, Ridley Scott's immortal piece, uh, Replicants, those are bots as humans, you can't tell the difference, or Joaquin Phoenix in her falling in love with his bot, Scarlett Johansson, who could blame him for that. Um, so the whole concept, though, of artificial intelligence you're creating life is really not new. Uh, once upon a time, a volcano erupted, uh, Mount Tambora in the Dutch East Indies, um, and it created a, essentially a volcanic winter. All the crops died. People thought it was the end of the world. Um, and at Villa Diodati in Lake Geneva, which was a popular summer vacation spot in June, it was freezing cold outside and rainy and dark. And some of the best authors of the day got together. Lord Byron and a gentleman by the name of John William Polidori rented the house and they invited their friends Mary Shelley and uh, Perth Shelley over to, uh, to visit with them. And not being able to go outside, they had what I consider to be the greatest ghost story contest in the history of the world. And by all accounts, Polidori should have won for coming up with Vampire, which was the progenitor of all of the modern Dracula stories, and unfortunately, much to his chagrin, Mary Shelley barfed up Frankenstein. Uh, Frankenstein, the modern Prometheus. To me, Frankenstein, the modern Prometheus, is a story about an artificial intelligence or a bot basically gone bad. Um, so, let's see if I can run this slide. I can't make a play. Here we go. Mm. <laughs> alive. <laughs> it's alive. It's alive. So apart from being my homage to Gene Wilder, rest in peace Gene Wilder, um, we look at the notion of creating life uh, in literature and in history, Isaac Bashevis Singer in 1969 wrote a book called De Gollum about a clay statue brought to life to save a town. The mystical rabbi of the town, Rabbi Loeb, eventually is eaten by the Gollum. 
Um, so m making life or trying to create artificial life is a recurring theme. And so bots, to me, and why we're doing this, are the new modern Prometheus. We are all chasing a god myth, which is kind of why people are afraid of artificial intelligence, and yet we seem unable to stop doing it, and I think we're unlikely to ever stop. Maybe this time, though, there are some elements about what's happening today in technology that allow us to get this right. Uh, one of the things is that artificial intelligence, natural language processing, machine learning have been embedded into the computer science curriculum, so we're developing a huge community of people who graduate with this set of skills. Um, technology like neural networks and machine learning uh, will equal ultimately better natural language understanding um, at, a, at a, I think, high level. And of course, we are understanding how editorial can help us create sort of a soul and a personality, which is a theme that I talk about very often. So there's a singer, his name is Ed Sheeran, and what he says is that everything will be okay in the end, and if it's not okay, it's not the end. So I'm here to say I hope that this isn't the end of uh, yet another attempt to do bots and artificial intelligence. I hope it's the beginning. And I think everything will be very OK this time around based upon what I've seen over the last couple of days in the show. So thank you very, very much for allowing me to present my ideas about where we're going and where we've been. Thank you. So I am now going to take the last opportunity here. Do you want to sit in the middle? Do no? any of you care where I sit? <laughs> We're good. Okay. So, one moment. Um, just one brief note that we were supposed to have one of your partners here today to discuss, but although he flew all the way here from Mexico, he fell ill yeah. and is in the hospital. Uh, Peter Levitin, who is uh, my, my colleague in Calumny, uh, is uh, getting out of the hospital tonight. He's perfectly okay, but he has a little bit of a bleeding ulcer. And uh, he flew all the way from Mexico to be here and, and told me to, to say, this is still a big fucking idea. So our, 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 our thoughts to Peter. But um, so, you know, what, we've heard a lot about why people are building bots today. Um, but 16 years ago, there were a lot fewer people using the internet and instant messaging. So, you know, what... what what made you guys think it was such a big fucking idea? Like, what was your idea 16 years ago? It's hard, you know, it's hard to remember that when we started, most people were dialing up over 1,200 baud modems through AOL to connect to the internet. And the web uh, was not a multimedia environment. It was painfully slow. And what we found out was that what was painfully slow about the web was having to load a whole bunch of data over a dial-up connection. But we saw that instant messaging was lightning fast. In fact, instant messaging. And so we really did it to increase the speed of being able to get a response back from a question when you made a query instead of having to wait for the screen to refresh through an HTML page. So speed. Speed's what you need. Speed, right. S speed. That's Next to godliness. Speed, yeah. So. Um, you know, the a lot has advanced with uh, you know natural language and AI and things like that. Do you think that those things sort of essentially serve the master of speed at some level, or is, is it, you know are they separate from that sort of utilitarian um, factor? Well, we started chasing speed, but we discovered um, something else very very rapidly, which was um, intimacy. What what we discovered was what we could wrap. Um, information within a personality that had a sense of humor. Humor was essentially our hook. And when you speak in an instant messaging window, uh, you can achieve a great degree of intimacy very, very quickly. And that empowers you to do a tremendous amount with your, uh, your audience that you wouldn't otherwise be able to do in, let's say, a web interface. So uh, it started as speed, but it became, I think, very much more very quickly. Um, well, I, I, I went, you know, I remember when um, Smarter Child was around, you showed like the memes, right? Like that was a fairly common thing to do to take a screenshot of Smarter Child saying something funny. And one of the things that I found when I was doing research was like somebody saying something like, um, you know, something about their dog and then something else. 
And then, it, and then Smarter Child said something like, can we go back and talk about your dog's butt? Something like that, right? So like, and one of the earliest conversations you and I had was about that kind of functionality. Um, like, Smarter Child was able to remember things about you, right? We, we built very early um, a memory where Smarter Child remembered every conversation because at some very core level, um, shared memory is intimacy. So I, I chide people for making Dory the fish bots that have no memory at all. Uh, and there are two types of memory to have. There's long-term and short-term memory. Uh, most of the big bots today uh, don't even remember uh, from sentence to sentence what's going on, let alone anaphoric references within a conversation. So if you say, um, what's the weather in Austin, Texas, uh, and, and the bot tells you 87 degrees, Siri tells you 87 degrees, and you then say, um, I'd like a flight there, it says where? And so how can you develop intimacy with the Dory the Fish bot that doesn't remember anything? So the more you can remember about your, um, your conversations, the more intimate things become. And so we built that functionality into the Smarter Child interface from the ground up. Um, so what, it, like, what did it do? Like, you know, 30 million people talked to this thing. That was 10% of the global internet population. Um, you know, what, what did it do that caused people to use it and then spread it to their friends? You know, because I, I was saying earlier, like, I had it in my AOL list, but I have no idea how I would have found out about installing Smarter Child, so. Um, it was because of our enormous marketing spend. We spent uh, zero. On, uh, on marketing, not a penny. And what happened was Smarter Child caught fire and people simply told their friends about it and it was utterly frictionless. Adding a bot today to, uh, and this isn't a, a pop at the platform uh, vendors, but in a way it is. Uh, back then, if you wanted to add Smarter Child to your buddy list, you simply added Smarter Child to your buddy list. Today, you have to go through a series of steps to add a bot to your friends list. Uh, for a variety of reasons, and we think that lack of friction helped us grow very quickly. Also keep in mind, it was blue sky, green field, whatever you want to call it. We were the first, and so we call that the Star Trek distribution model to go where no one has gone before. Um, so we got there first, and that empowered us to really light a fire under um, the, the user environment. So it was, it was viral, and its all adoption was completely viral. Um. Before we move on from Smarter Child, you know, I, I, I think it's really interesting, like you, in 2000, uh, AOL Instant Messenger didn't have, you know, t today you just mentioned the platforms, right? We have uh, a wealth of different platforms to choose from and they all have open APIs and they're trying to lure us in to use their platform over somebody else's platform. AOL didn't have a, AOL Instant Messenger did not have an API. Did they want Smarter Child to be on AOL? No. <laughs> they, they hated it. Uh, they, they hated it in a way that made them uh, work very hard to prevent Smarter Child from getting onto the network. We hired uh, a gentleman by the name of Adam Fritzler, who at the time was 17 years old, to basically enter into a war with the AOL team that every time they changed their protocols on us, uh, we would hack them and put Smarter Child back on the network. And it wasn't until um, Radiohead, the band, called us up and wanted to produce a Radiohead bot, which we did called Googly Minotaur, that it turned out that the gentleman running Instant Messenger at the time at AOL was a huge Radiohead fan. So when we, when we put Radiohead uh, and the contract for putting Radiohead up onto AOL, we piggyback Smarter Child at the end of the contract, uh, like caboose legislation, into the contract. So this little thing we have, Smarter Child, is it okay if we put that up too? He said, yeah, 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 as long as we get Radiohead and I get a couple of tickets. So that's how Smarter Child came to be on AOL on a permanent basis without having to hack them. Um, I think we, you know, we've discussed, but there's a, a lesson maybe for contemporary bot makers there too, right? I mean, we love every, all of our platforms and, and they're all good actors right now, but that, that, that might change in the future, so. The, the platform's business agenda may or may not ultimately coincide with the business agenda of people who want to build businesses on their platforms. What you must remember is that, um, kind of like in Facebook, they say, that if you're not the client, you're the product. So 
uh, I would caution everybody in the room that you should find a way to make sure that you can never be kicked off of the platform. And there are a number of different ways to do that. We call it air support. Ours happen to have been sneaking in with Radiohead. I'm sure your creative group, you'll find hundreds of different ways to stay on the various platforms. So, so you know, having a popular bot was cool back then, I guess, anyways, but, like, how did, how did the Radiohead thing happen? Like, did Tom York call you up and, and, and say, like, oh, I talked to Smarter Child. It was cool. Can I have one? Uh, they called us on the telephone and said, hey, you know, we're with Radiohead, this band, and uh, a few of us knew who that was and thought that was cool. And Peter uh, said, no, that's incredibly cool. Uh, if Peter was here, what he would have said is, after 17 years at Saatchi and Saatchi, they had an, uh, a saying... And the saying is, uh, when you get a gift from God, which was Radiohead for us, you take it. So we argued over the course of a weekend where our board of directors and our venture capitalists did not want to do the Radiohead bot. And ultimately, Peter, as the CEO, said, yeah, yeah, we're going to do this anyway. And then we built it. And um, the rest is sort of history. Then we built, by the way, a Madonna bot. Uh, we built several bots for uh, Time Warner Music. Uh, we built literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of bots over the course of several years. Um, I want to come back to that, but can we talk a little bit about like what the composition of your team was at that time? You know, I think a lot of people out here are wondering, like, what's their bot team going to look like? You know, what did your bot team look like? Uh, I'm so glad none of them are in the room. That, that we were an island of misfit toys. Uh, we had... We had people who had skills in uh, editorial, in advertising, public relations, uh, programming and development from Windows to Mac. Uh, we had uh, business development executives. We had uh, artists, uh, graphic designers, cartoonists, uh, pretty much from uh, oh, content licensing professionals, uh, finance majors somebody from every walk of life, and we were fortunate that the concept of having a bot on instant messaging was such an exciting thing back then that the level of talent that we had in the room at any given time was extraordinary. Um, I joke about uh, Chris Bray having unfortunately gotten stuck running apple.com, uh, but virtually every person who came out of the ActiBuddy Colocus environment has ended up running some major business. Matt Barbanel, for example, who ran our network, uh, ended up running uh, BitTorrent's network, and, um, and now he got bought in because he was running the network at Beats by Dre, so he runs Apple Music. Um, or, um, oh my gosh, uh, Ka Kathy uh, Spade Zajac uh, ran uh, our business development and ended up running the frequent uh, flyer program for United Airlines, a uh, you know, multi-billion dollar program. So virtually every person that we had working for us moved on to become enormously successful in their own business space. So, oh, and they all played in a band. Every one of them played music of some kind or another. So I think music is the one thing we all shared in common. They all played in one big band, like no, one big they family all had band. their own band. It's New York. Everybody has their own band. <laughs> Oh, uh, several of my employees are in bands, and I'm, I, I live in like a constant fear that they're gonna like join a super group and go on tour and leave me alone. Um, that would be sad. So, so okay, so you built Smarter Child, and you, you guys launched it, and it was fairly successful. Did, did, did Smarter Child have a business model or like a, you know, a revenue uh, source at all, or was it sort of just your flagship you know, thing? Um, Smarter Child had several business models because we as a company had none. Uh, we, we tried everything to monetize the bot. Uh, we tried advertising, which is one of the obvious business models. So in order to do that, we hacked Google AdSense. Uh, we tried stats. We had a full stats engine. We, at that time, there were no stats engines like Dash. So we, we hooked it up to uh, Web Trends, created the notion of a session within instant messaging. Uh, we tried subscription sales. Uh, we sold 10,000 subscriptions to Smarter Child. Uh, we tried everything except what Kip is doing, which is shopping. Um, and some of it worked and some of it didn't. didn't. Ultimately, uh, we ended up in the enterprise space selling customer service agents 
to, to companies to try and reduce the cost of customer service with escalation support. Uh, that's about the point at which I left the company because I could care less about the customer service agent business. To me, the last person you want to speak with when you're upset about a business is a robot. Um, I can get that from any call center in Cork, Ireland, or, or India. It's, I mean, it's, cra it's crazy to me to hear that kind of stuff because, like, the, con the t contemporary conversation is still, like, I don't know, s content sales or, like, I don't know, customer service seems like a pretty good place to put this and make money. Um, so, you know, and S Smarter Child explored all those things, and then, and then you guys went on and actually were an agency that built bots for clients and, 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 and customers. Were there, like, other iterations in between? Well... Keep in mind, we, Smarter Child lived until Microsoft ultimately acquired the company, and Microsoft acquired the company not for Smarter Child, which was a disaster for them, not unlike Tay. Uh, Smarter Child had all of the technology to prevent the Tay disaster, but Microsoft probably has a room that looks like the Raiders of the Lost Ark warehouse, and uh, you know they, maybe they put Smarter Child's code in the Ark of the Covenant or next door to the Ark of the Covenant and forgot that they had a curse word filter when the Tay disaster occurred to them. Um, that building customer service bots was a good way to get paid. So we built a customer service agent, CSR agent, for Intel, Comcast, AT&T, uh, Lotus, uh, Microsoft itself. Uh, just about every major company you can name at that time had a bot that was trying to do customer service. So that worked as a business model until Microsoft, in a moment of rare austerity, uh, decided that they were gonna cut back a little bit after their Tell Me acquisition and uh, decided to shelve the, the Smarter Child and ultimately uh, Colloquus project. So they tried it, it worked. It's an okay business model, um, but perhaps there are more interesting ones to try. Do you think, like, Smarter Child's um, little robot brain is in a jar somewhere, like, please let me out? S Smarter Child's robot brain is in a jar in Jim Pollock's basement in Glen Rock, New Jersey, next to a guitar that I loaned him in, in 2002. <laughs> and, um, and I bought back the code from Microsoft in uh, 2009, between 2009 and 2011. I negotiated with the Treasury Department of, there's a Treasury Department at Microsoft, to, uh, to buy back the code from them. And their big question was, what are you gonna use this for? And I said, I don't know, maybe cell phones. And, uh, and they said, okay. So, uh, so it's still um, in, a, in a jar, in a, in a basement in Glen Rock, New Jersey. Like most good code from 2002 is, or ever it was. Well, Microsoft asked us if we wanted to buy back the version that they had made fully compliant with SOAP and .NET, and I said no. We want the version we sold you, which was in Linux. Thank you very much. What was it? It was a Java. It was a combination of a variety of different things. There was Perl. It was it was Perl. There was <laughs> Java. There was Bash. There was C. I don't know. Maybe there was Fortran, Lisp, Apple Logo. Who knows what we used back then? <laughs> so, you know, in 2001, you guys. 2002, you, you guys had reached 30 million people, was 10% of the global internet population, which was 300 million people. You know, there are 300 million people who use Kik today. So, like, I have a couple questions, actually. Like, did, did, do, you, do you think, did people have uh, cognitive dissonance about using, you know, chatting with a chatbot 15 years ago? Was it like a thing that people had to figure out and get over? No, they, that ultimately that what we found out was that people talked to it at night like it was a friend. I mean, I, I went home from, from the office uh, and my 17-year-old my babysitter in New Jersey, Jackie Mazzola, uh, I asked her, um, hey, have you ever heard of Smarter Child? And she said, oh, don't even talk to me about Smarter. I'm so mad at him, I'm not even going to speak to him again. And so they personified the bot, and we learned that if you do it right and you give your, your bot a, a personality and a soul, which is really not a technical problem, it's an editorial problem, a lot of the technical problems have been solved and have been solved for quite some time. What we have here is an editorial problem. Uh, uh, Andy Morrow uh, said it very well this morning. He said, uh, you know, the, 
the inbound problem of understanding what people are saying is pretty much solved. The question is, how do you answer? And one of the conversations we had at dinner and was a big problem at the company was uh, a lot of people, and when you have 30 million people, a lot of people are going to say a lot of different things. So we talked about how they would ask about having sex with the bot, and we would say, oh, no, you don't want to do that. I'm just a robot. You know, I couldn't do that. I'm made of steel uh, or aluminum. But some people were asking, um, and these were teens, teen users. Remember, the demographic of instant message was primarily teens. They were asking, um, I'm thinking of committing suicide. And so we ended up in a very serious ethical dilemma, which is something that people really haven't discussed very heavily. You are going to all face an extreme ethical dilemma as you program up something which is going to, back then we didn't have the problem of people going in and shooting up schools pre-Columbine, right? So we ended up having to talk with our attorneys and ultimately the decision was made for us by our attorneys and board that um, we would give blank air. So if you ask Smarter Child, I'm thinking of committing suicide, the legal response was we said nothing, which we thought was unethical. So there is an ethical dilemma that you face in the editorial aspect of this that you should all deeply consider because you will all one day face these kinds of considerations. So I urge you to think about this very, very carefully in terms of how you respond to questions from 30 million or 40 million or hundreds of millions of people. So I'm glad that you brought that up because I think computer design ethics are, is a subject that is not discussed very often. And one of the things that I think about, and I'm not going to go on about this too much because I want to get back to more questions, but like, there's never been a time. Now, so we had 300 million people back then. Now there are 3 billion people on the internet. And we have hundreds of millions of people, like Facebook Messenger, for example, right? They talk about there are 900 million people who use Facebook Messenger. And what are the ethical responsibilities or like how does somebody like Mikhail who seems like a really great guy, like how does he think about the decision to like move the pay now button in the toolbar, you know, and put it, put it there or there, right? And like the, the actual implication that might have on the real world and like the actual interactions that we have day to day with each other, right? Like the, there's never before been a thing where like a 26 year old software designer in San Francisco could like make a decision and like impact the world on, on that scale at that pace. Except for maybe the development of the Apple computer, which was a couple of 26-year-old guys who changed the entire world. I, I think it's always uh, young people who are changing the world for the rest of us because I have to tell you, I'm 52 years old. I don't feel like doing this again. <laughs> so, so youth matters. So, okay. So Microsoft got, bought you guys in uh, 2006 for quite a bunch of money and um, did some stuff, but that eventually sunset the, most of the stuff that they had acquired from you guys. And generally speaking, like, you guys were the commercial bot company, and then there was a 10-year gap, basically, before the next commercial bot company thought that that was a, a reasonable idea. And I mean, honestly, when we were out pitching the idea of a commercial bot company, a lot of the people that we talked to a year, just a year ago were like, that's crazy. You're nuts. Um, so, you know, what, 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 did bots hibernate for 10 years? You know, what happened to bots? Where have they been hiding? You... There, there are different theories about this. I think um, the best theory uh, belongs to Rachel Sue, who, who said that um, really they just morphed into uh, sims. They became characters in games. Um, they didn't go away. They were like dinosaurs. They became birds. So uh, the interactive instant messaging bot went away but we still saw bots living within uh, sims and games. So uh, they changed formats, but they really never went away. And I think the whole theme of my little talk today is they've, they've never really gone away in our consciousness. We've, we've always sort of thought there are going to be bots, just as we think there are going to be flying cars. Uh, we all sort of know that, you know, the Hanna-Barbera world in which we have a flying car that folds into a briefcase. And ultimately, somebody will invent that. I guess in this case it's going to be Elon Musk that gives us the flying car. Uh, we'll just have to wait for him to do that. In your case, it's going to be one of you that comes up with the ultimate bot. Um, I think I'm just going to ask this one more question, if that's all right. Um, you know, so we've seen two days of 
talks about people building bots and inspiring stuff and tools and, um, and you know, this emerging set of best practices and designs and interesting questions that we all have to ask ourselves um, as we move forward. You know, like, you are one of the rare people, you know, maybe one of the, 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 you're probably the only person in the room who can speak from the perspective of, like, have done, you know, been there, done that. Like, what would you tell us as, you know, the next generation of bot developers, like, what, what, what do we need to be paying attention to? Um, you know, what's the, um, you know, what, what, you know, what, what, what's the subject that maybe we, we, we didn't, you know, are, aren't thinking about right now, but, but, but should? That's a very good question. Um, so, I think both God and devil are in the details. So you're all product designers, and I think what you have to think about when you're building your products is everything. You have to consider um, extensively how your end users will receive your bot. You have to consider uh, the context of your business models very carefully, your relationship with distribution, which is your platform providers. Um, I think that there is um, an overriding consideration, which is um, does your bot need or have or want to have a personality? That is to say, is your bot a persona um, or is your bot simply a question and answering system? And I think where I've come down on this is that if, if interactive agents and bots are really going to succeed, I think you have to really consider your editorial focus. So uh, those of you who are building bots on behalf of other people, have to consider the editorial focus and persona of your, your brand partners, your brand marketers. Those of you who are building bots for yourselves have to consider your own brand's editorial focus, your bot's editorial. Give your bot a memory, give your bot a personality, and try and give it a soul. Awesome. Um, thank you so much for coming, Robert. It's, this was my, when I set out to do this conference, I said, I got to get uh, the Af Active Buddy guys on stage. You made my dream come true. Thank you so much. And again, thank you everybody for coming. Um, this is it. This is the end of Talkabot 1.0. Thank you. <laughs>